Hello, and welcome to YWCA's Facebook Live Connect, Heal, Learn speaker series. I'm Laura Gomez Horton, Clinical Director of YWCA Greater Austin. For those who are unfamiliar, YWCA Greater Austin provides individual, couple, family, and group therapy, care coordination services, life skills classes, school based services, consultation, training, and advocacy. Our mission is to eliminate racism, empower women, stand up for social justice, help families, and strengthen communities, which we've been doing in the Central Texas area for over 115 years. We truly stand at the intersection of mental health and social justice. This speaker series focuses on inviting subject matter experts to discuss topics connected to mental wellness and social justice. This month, we are honoring Black History Month by recognizing Black leaders making history today who are elevating and empowering the Central Texas community and working for racial equity. Today, we are joined by Anita, Anitra Edwards and Monique Parker, who are both um, well experienced in nonprofits and in our local community. And we will begin by having them introduce themselves and a little bit about what they do. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Sure. Um, my name, uh, as you mentioned, is Monique Parker. I am the uh, founder and executive director of Little Bit of Good um, and also the uh, CEO of Blow Candle Co. Um, I'm assuming we'll hop into what the organization is all about. So I'll save my uh, elevator pitch for then. Thank you, Monique. Thank you. I'm Anitra Edwards, as Laura mentioned. I currently am a program manager for Explore Austin, um, and I'll share what that is too later on. Um, but my background is in nonprofits. I worked for various nonprofits in the Austin area, and my kind of focus is youth and empowering youth in all ages or various stages of their life, um, you know, for racial, just social justice reasons, but also just, you know, empowering them to be the best people they can be, so. Wonderful, well, welcome to you both. I really appreciate you giving up some of your Friday to, to be here today. Um, so as we're honoring Black History Month, I kind of wanted to start off just at the top of what does that, what does Black History Month mean for you in, in a more personal way? Uh, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I think it, it takes on new meanings, honestly, every year. Um, but generally speaking, I think that Black History Month is really always a reminder for me and also a swift kick in the butt. Um, you know, a reminder of how far we've come, a reminder of what the fight and the journey for racial, social justice, um, specifically for Black Americans, um, you know, a reminder of what that journey has been, but also, you know, that push to keep driving forward, to keep doing the work that we're doing, um, you know, the recognition that we still have a long way to go. And, you know, unfortunately, in certain areas, we've taken a couple steps back, but I think it's just always a good reminder and time for me for reflection. Um, uh, and also just a lot of thanks just in general for those that came well before us. Um, but yeah, it's always a special time. Yeah, yeah I'll say all of that. I second it. And then um, just kind of highlighting on that reflection piece. Um, I think the world that we live in now is completely different than the world that, you know, Black History Month usually focuses on, like they take us way back to a certain part, um, but it's also very same, like similar. And so for me, it's reflecting on how times were and where we were as a people and then where we are now and just not trying to just skip over the in-between, but like truly appreciating what we've come from, also where we are, and then really looking at that in-between. And as Monique said, like how far we've come, but also how much further um, we have to go. And Black History Month for me was much different as when I was a kid versus now. I feel like as a kid, it was this exciting time where we had presentations, we had things at school, we had book reports. Like it was, I feel like it was, it was a very in-depth time. 
versus now as an adult, it's like, okay, whatever my company's doing, whatever social media is doing. Um, mm-hmm. So for me, Black history is a reminder that I need to make it fun and exciting for my son and for my nieces, like the new generation of kids so that they don't forget why this month is so important. Um, so that's what it means to me. Wow, yeah, I hadn't thought about that, that yeah, as kids, we enjoy and we're, as we're learning and discovering and we're celebrating and as adults, now it's our responsibility that, oh, now it's part of my work. But but like you said, maybe it's, you know, not just part of the work, but yeah, how, how do we truly live it? Um, I was, you know, and, and you mentioned also the other thing you mentioned, Anitra, also that was striking is just the, the fact that we look back, but yeah, we also need to look now at the present and, and the in-between and how and similar still, like, like you said, still have a long ways to go. Um, so originating in 1925, the way to recognize the accomplishments and contributions of uh, Black African Americans and expanding throughout the decades to emphasize the importance of Black history is, um, oh, I'm sorry, is how, how have, it, it, it originated, in 1925, it was originating to really recognize the accomplishments. And so how have Black or African Americans influenced your life and how important has representation been for you? I'll, I'll go first this time, Monique, to give you a break. <laughs> um, for me, the example that I can think of is, of course, I have people in my family that are great um, representation because they're your immediate family, you know, they're immediate, right? But for me, I think of two of my most instrumental and influential um, influences in my life were two Black teachers, and they were Black women. And I think they might have been the only Black teachers. <laughs> um, but the first one was my fourth grade black teacher and she taught me a lot about just how to present myself how to show up and like have confidence and be you know just because you're in a space or maybe you might be the only black kid like you don't have to act or be how people perceive you or put you in a box um I was very gifted at that age but I didn't see it in myself and so she was very big on like focus on me and being very attentional intentional um and she was very much like, don't, don't dim your light because no one else around you is doing the things that you're doing. She was like, no, you be great. You be exceptional. They'll catch up. And if they don't, that like, that's on them. And that was the first time I think I really understood that. And she, she called it out and was like, you are a black girl. You are a black woman. You're going to be a black woman. You have great potential. Don't ever like dim your light. Right. So that was influential. And then when I get to high school, I had my next um, black woman teacher, she was my physics teacher and she was tough. And she was like, yeah, you're great, but you have to work at it and you have to work harder than your peers. Like just being great is not gonna be enough. You have to be exceptional. And she explained why, you know, she wasn't afraid to have those conversations. As a black youth, you have to do these things and be exceptional to get the scholarships, to get the chance, to get the doors open to you. And so that representation of those two women who showed up and were fierce and brave, and they were in my community, they were accessible. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a celebrity on TV who I couldn't, you know, engage with. These were two strong influences who directly poured into me. And that representation has just completely changed or really impacted who I am now. Um, And I try to re-give those messages to kids that I work with is don't shrink don't dim your light. You know, if you're powerful, you have strengths, engage those, whatever they are, like engage in them um, and use them for good, you know, use them to empower other people. And so that's what that representation for me meant um, and how it's kind of empowered me to then empower my own community. I was very long-winded, sorry. That's great, no. Not long-winded at all. Um, I'll lean more into um, just representation in general, and also just piggybacking off what you mentioned, Anitra, in terms of um, just calling out for people, you know, 
For me, I come from Washington state and it is predominantly white in Washington. And growing up, I feel like it was always... I don't know, kind of trying to give me the feel that we're all the same, we're all alike, like not calling out the differences. But I think it's so important. And especially now as I have two children that I'm raising in Texas, we're in a predominantly white area of Texas for me to recognize and spotlight and put shine on the fact that no, you are two black women. And that is so fantastic and amazing and special every day of the year, instead of making them feel like, no, you know, we're all human. We're all the same. It's like, no, call out the differences because I think that you do a disservice when you don't, because we are going to experience very different things because of the color of our skin. So I think that was something that was super important. Um, to call out just in general and something that, you know, allies and people who don't identify as Black can also keep in mind, calling it out and recognizing, you know, that someone is Black. It's not a scary thing to say or do. Um, But when it comes to representation, it's been said over and over and over and over. But as far as, you know, if you can see it, you can do it. I think that that is so incredibly important. And especially when it comes to, um, you know, demographic representation in multiple different spaces. I feel like the conversation used to just be about technology and we need black engineers and black leadership, but just in general across the board, we need to see black people in the arts and black people, you know, leading everyday jobs. It doesn't have to be at the top of the biggest industry that we need to tackle. I think representation at all levels is so incredibly important. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you both kind of went exactly where where I was thinking. It's like the people right next to you sometimes are the most important, you know, it's like the, the people you don't even like, it's not celebrities necessarily. Yes, they are. They're good role models and things like that and athletes. And that's wonderful. But at the same time, it's like the teacher or your neighbor or your aunt or, um, you know, and, and now you all are in those roles also that, you know, as you're looking back, like who influenced you? It's like, now you're in those roles of like, who are you influencing and teaching your kids of how they can influence others as well. Um, so thank you for that. I think a lot of times that goes amiss in, in our communities and in our worlds, how important a teacher is or uh, a neighbor. Yeah. Um, I know I was reading about, and I actually did not know this, that in 1976, it was decided like there was going to be a theme placed on uh, Black History Month. And so this year's theme is Black Resistance. Um, what are some well resistance as in the fact of um of of resistance of historical and ongoing oppression is, is more more what is focused on um what are some of the areas where maybe you are resisting or in your community where resistance to oppression and to injustice and how are you emphasizing that maybe in your roles that you are in or in just your private life I think quickly for me, um, this is something that I try to do intentionally. And it's something that I think about when making decisions that may feel like huge or scary is like, okay, if we're speaking in terms of oppression and we're talking about systemic racism um, and white supremacy, they don't want me to succeed, right? Or they don't want me to dream and do the big things or be happy and joyful and live my fullest life. And so I use that as motivation. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to try things. I'm going to do everything that I want to do 
because the pressures don't want me to. Um, and so I think personally, that is my form of resistance. Um, when we talk about, from more of the professional perspective, I've decided to work in a field that supports Black people in the Black community. Um, I spend time in areas that specifically support uh, racial injustice. <clears throat> so I think that it's just making decisions both in my everyday and then how I show up professionally um as my my resistance for sure I love that I want to like channel that take it home with me um uh, I love it <laughs> uh for my answer I'm gonna connect like my personal resistance like to my personal experience and also my my role in my job so for me personally like as someone who's from Austin and has seen Austin change um with you know gentrification and just people specifically white people moving in and kind of making, trying to make this space theirs. Um, but then also going into spaces that was de designated specifically for black people. And we were put there um, to kind of taking those spaces on now. Um, part of my experience as a person, you know, a black woman in Austin um, in my new role of being in the outdoors and trying to bring the outdoors to youth of color um, I see that as a resistance of like you 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 tried to force us out of spaces, but now we're we're kind of making our stance like no, we're still going to be here, and we're still going to be a part of spaces that we're not we haven't been allowed to or there was gatekeeping we haven't been accessible or had access to it, um, specifically the outdoors. And I personally am learning now, and my my role is like how therapeutic and how healing nature can be. And I feel like as a young black kid out the outdoors was fun when you played with your neighbors and stuff, but actually learning those technical skills of like how to pitch a tent and camp and do all those things. I didn't have access to that people I know didn't have access to that because it wasn't presented as a safe space for us home and neighborhood was safe outdoors camping wilderness that was not safe. And so because those things have been kind of gate like kept from us I really enjoy this new world where now I'm offering this opportunity to youth to see the outdoors as healing and they get to you know access mentors and healthy relationships and get to explore um and so i see that as a form of resistance it's like we've been kept out of a lot of spaces and now we're we're coming for them or we're coming back to them um and so that's that's my personal experience of resistance um and how i feel like black austin is really trying to create more room and space for its um you know, community to, to stay here. Um, and we're not going to be just shoved out or put into a, a corner. So that's my personal resistance, but also in my role in my work too. That's wonderful. I love the, the way you both describe that. Um, cause oftentimes the term resistance is often has negative connotation with it. And we see that happening so much with people with, you know, people in general and the media always putting this negative spin on any kind of advocacy that is done or any kind of protests against injustices. Um, what are some thoughts you might have about that? And how how can we communicate it more like you just you both just did? I think it's a lot of trial and error and saying the wrong things and having grace both on yourself and for others. I think that, you know, we're all in a very different stage of our activism or our knowledge and, you know, all of that. And so just being open to learning and open to being wrong about what you're saying as well. Um, but when it comes to activism, and again, we live in Texas, and this is a very new experience for me. I've been here eight years now, but I come from the West Coast. So we all, it's wildly different. And coming here and during, you know, high Trump era, and uh, we're talking about guns a lot and abortion and all of that, and really finding myself in my place and like, okay, well, what is my form of fight? And what does that look like for me? Because there are certain things that I'm not ready to go there yet. Don't feel comfortable doing that, but really figuring out just me by myself, what do I care about? How do I want to show up, um, you know, to support that? I think it's, it's such a personal thing too. Mm -hmm. Um, 
For me, I would say, you know, as you, as you mentioned, like resistance can be kind of negative or shown in a negative way. Um, and it's always going to be that way as long as the people who are in power or who are doing the oppressing, when the oppressed decide to resist and fight back, we're never going to be shown in a favor or favorable way. Um, so two things I try to keep in mind is one, being okay with, like, as Monique said, being wrong or not being um, given em- enough grace, but still be the second thing is being intentional like having a goal or a reason as to why you are doing what you're doing, whether it's your own personal motivation or your community or whatever reason that you are resisting something or you are trying to like get something back, being intentional and saying, this is my goal. Like, I'm not here to cause, you know, chaos or disruption just for no reason. Like I'm, I'm here for a a reason. I want kids of color, you know, or specifically black kids to have these opportunities. I want communities who've been erased to have a chance to not just survive, but thrive. And so just being intentional with your language and your goal, you still may not be shown in a nice positive light, but no one can ever tell you that what you're doing is wrong. If you yourself have said, this is why I'm here and this is what I'm here for. Mm -hmm. And just staying on that path. And yeah. yeah. Well, and people just need to understand it's they're not going to feel comfortable. And when they don't feel comfortable, that's when they shine that negative light is, you know, it's somebody else doing something harm to them. And it's like, no, no, <laughs> that's not what it is. Um, and we see that right now, especially with all the legislation that is being introduced about erasing, you know, book bans and uh, changing educational system of what can be taught, what can't be taught, all these different things are trying to, you know, just keep oppressing and keep keep the information from being out there. Um, Anitra, I think you you alluded to this earlier as you're growing up, you know, some of the barriers that you had to overcome, you know, and some of the, the things, challenges that you faced a little bit. So I wanted to kind of touch on that a little bit about you're both um, in, you know, in a different role right now, but there was a long journey here probably. And there were a lot of things to overcome. So what are some barriers that you overcame in your life to get to where you are right now, the stage of life that you are right now? Whew, talk about a long answer. Um, some barriers I, I feel that I've had to overcome um, was just, you know, my mom was a single mom of multiple children. Um, so just accessibility. Um, you know, she was trying to keep, you know, raise us and give us a good life. So she didn't always have access to, you know, extracurricular activities or other things that might have given us a step, a stepping stool um, into certain areas of our, you know, life or that would have set us up better. Um, so that's just, that's one barrier Two, I feel like I've, I've faced a lot of gatekeeping. Um, you know, when you're in high school and you have Sometimes you do have teachers who, you know, tell you, no, you shouldn't apply for that college. There's no way you're going to get in, or you sh- you shouldn't apply for that scholarship. That's not for your, you know, your, your type of person or little things like that. And so I've had to overcome people telling me that certain spaces or opportunities weren't for me because just go the easier route, just go to community college, just do this, just, you know, go the, you know, don't try to be a psychologist or do an easier um, major or things like that. Um, so I've had to overcome like barriers of the people who were put in front of me, who, you know, probably weren't the best people who should have been in those roles. Um, so just getting past them, but then those experiences then creating a second layer of, of self-doubt. So it's like, mm-hmm. once I did accomplish these things that I, they said I couldn't do graduating college on time, you know, getting these great, you know, jobs and things like that, then you, you have, those voices are still there right? And then Mm -hmm. you have the imposter syndrome or you have like, now you're in all these white spaces or, you know, you're the only person of color when you look to your left and to your right. And then you have those messages of like, maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe I did, you know, take on more than I could handle. And so then there's the barrier of self-doubt. And so really trying to focus on those voices and understanding why I feel the way I feel sometimes, and then just Mm -hmm. shutting it out and be, and reminding myself, no one can do a better job than me. The job that I want to do, the work I want to do, no one can do it better than I can. And I know that because I've trained for it. I prepared for it. And so it's mine. 
And so just having to remind myself of that um, and getting through those barriers, I'm, I'm just really proud to be here. Um, and I really hope to keep inspiring other girls who may have feel the same way that I do to, you can get here too. Um, and here might look different than, you know, for everybody. Like mm -hmm. I enjoy the job I'm in. I enjoy the flexibility of it. So this is my here. This is my success, my success story. Um, so also being okay with identifying your own success and being okay or happy with where you are and not trying to accept what someone else was trying to give you basically. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So as far as barriers go, or I, I guess things that we have overcome um, in life, I feel like when I look back at my story to this point, it has been, you know, pretty smooth riding. Life in general, I feel like my upbringing and, and family life and everything was great. Um, I had, I got pregnant in college um, and had my first daughter my senior year. And while I guess I could be considered a barrier um, because I was still in school, I was taking my baby to school and we were getting it done. I feel like after that, my life kind of went up from there. I found my career. I had, you know, my baby now. So I needed to hustle and I got into corporate life and that was my everything. Like all of my goals and aspirations were, you know, climbing the corporate ladder and raising the ranks um, in that area. And I feel like it wasn't really until later in adulthood that I've recently started experiencing what I feel are some major kind of life hurdles and more so in terms of like what I'm doing with my life. And so for me, it was, okay, you've worked all these years and years and years getting to this certain professional level within this industry. And now you've reached that point and you kind of don't like what you're doing anymore. And for mm -hmm. me, I worked in um, DEI within the tech space and especially during George Floyd era and the couple of years post George Floyd, it became a really rough time to be a black DEI professional in the tech space. And I was like, well, if you don't want to do this job, what will you do? Because you've worked your whole life to be in this career and having to face that and then recognize the things that I wanted to do and then recognize how huge of a left turn that was going to be. Um, and thinking about like, oh my gosh, there's a way, a big difference between tech and nonprofit and then time. And what if this happens and what if everything goes wrong and really just navigating, you know, the fear of like being an adult who's trying to try something new with responsibilities now. Um, so I'd say that probably the last two years of just like allowing myself to step out there a little bit and make that transition and pivot, um, was definitely, has definitely continues to be um, a challenge and something that I'm working through, but happy with the decisions I've made. So um, yeah, interesting, interesting time it's been. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like, you know, you, you both have overcome. So even maybe little, little bumps in the road and things like that, it seems like, you know, you, you managed them, you handled them. Um, and Anitra, one, one of the things you mentioned also, it sounds like what you were trying to do is increase the volume of the voices of the teachers that you mentioned earlier and decrease the volume of the, all the negative voices that told you you couldn't or you shouldn't um, or that it wasn't for you. So back to that resistance piece of, uh -uh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so because, you know, we, we do focus on, on mental health, I try to bring in that mental health perspective and I know you all have touched on it a little bit too. Um, and, and have mentioned some, some of what I'm about to say. So one of the things that we notice with the people that we work with is that as they begin to heal from trauma, they start feeling more strength to confront some of the things that are challenging them, whether it's a barrier or you know racism, discrimination, whatever has has hurt them, um, they begin to feel like they can 
towards changing things or towards um, um, turning the tables, you know, like, you know, if they were hurt as children, how do we support children? You know, they begin to, to move into spaces where they start advocating or where they start mobilizing, not just for themselves, but for others. Um, and I started to hear that in your stories too, that, that somehow in your life, you started to feel stronger or in, empowered to others. And I know that you're doing that in your jobs. Um, how are you using your roles right now to advance those causes that are important to you? Um, for me specifically, I, uh, Little Bit of Good, which is my organization, officially launched in August. Um, and we have our first cohort coming up um, next month. But I, as I made the transition from working in DEI and then deciding to go nonprofit route, I still wanted to work in some sort of equity function or definitely still have that focus and primarily supporting the Black community. Um, I just wasn't necessarily sure how when I first started thinking about it. Um, but in seeing, you know, the different inequities and in funding and all of that, decided that that was going to be my lane. Um, and I always have been the type of person who wants to support all the causes though. So when I was like, okay, you got to like comb this down. Like, are we supporting the puppies? Are we doing something for the humans? Is it the environment? Like, who are we helping? And I was like, I just, I can't pick a lane. So I also <laughs> wanted to do something that was like, okay, you can truly help or support all the causes, but still be narrowly focused on serving the Black community. Um, so through the Accelerator, we work with Black-led organizations and Black leaders to grow and develop them in terms of strategy and data um, and capacity support um, so that they can go out and now scale their missions. So technically, I'm still getting to support the puppies and the environment and all the things, but through a very specific way. Um, and I think the the way that we are developing these Black leaders ultimately is really supporting our um, Black community here locally because of the work that they're doing, supporting. So we support them, they support the community, and it's just this big trickle effect. Did we lose Laura? We might have, um, but that's okay. I'll give my answer. Yes. Uh, okay, your answer was phenomenal, and that was like very efficient and genius. Like, how do I do what I want to do, but make it efficient and actually work? And you seem to have really figured it out. So kudos to you. Um, in my, in my role, um, now in my, how I talked about with Explore Austin, we, uh, have, it's a mentorship program for kiddos to join when they're starting seventh grade and they stay in it for six years until they graduate high school. Um, and we use the outdoors to kind of mentor them. And so they get to learn different outdoor skills, canoeing, rock climbing, um, camping, navigating, all that good stuff. Um, for, for me personally, um, I would say the, the ability to just provide the opp that opportunity and that space um, to kiddos who may be experiencing things or you know, don't necessarily have the tools um, to face challenges and things like that. When they come to these, it's literally called Saturday challenges. You know, they get to learn those coping skills. If you don't know how to do something, someone's going to teach you, or you're going to have friends there who are experiencing it with you. Um, they get the chance to try really tough or maybe scary things with an actual su support system around them. So that way, when they're not in our program in their everyday life, those tools are, you know, can, can hopefully translate over. So when they do face tough things at home or in school um, or in life and tough being, you know, just a vague word, not specific, you know, trauma, but just anything tough, then they'll have those tools um, to manage that. And so I, I really appreciate being here in this role because specifically kids of color who, um, like I said before, don't have access to nature. Um, I never knew that nature is now like a form of therapy, like there's out, uh, outdoor therapy. Um, and so to know that there's a tool, there's a, 
form of therapy or healing that a lot of these kids didn't know about or didn't have access to may now get to get get that um is is really the reason why I'm I'm here and I really find the joy that I do um it's one thing to offer kiddos who've experienced trauma or um life the ba- the basic stuff um but to take a step further and give them something that doesn't have to be expensive or is easily accessible just going outside and doing something um as a coping skill to get through life it's like you just can't do it but there's not much better so yeah thank you i want to touch on something you said in nature real quickly it's just about healing spaces uh green spaces as healing spaces there actually is some research that shows that um more urban areas where there's more concrete because the temperatures are hotter and there's an increase in violence and the more green spaces there are um, more trees more green places that you can go and you know kick a ball around or play play something swing that actually there's less because it impacts people's attitudes and uh, if you have a place to go and get your energy out um then you're not going to be all pent up and stressed. So definitely, I can learn more about that at a different topic. <laughs> um, but I'm glad that you're you're in that role. Um, and both of you, just the way you're talking, it's like it, and and that's why I wanted to emphasize that today you all are making history too. You know, yes, we can acknowledge the past. And everything, but you all are making history too. Whether whether you know it or not, whether you embrace it or not, you are, and you're making a difference in people's lives. Um, what are some things that you would like to share with others as they are paving their way to and making history for themselves and others as well? What are some words that you might have for for the Black community or the community in general, but particularly Black community? I think as we talk about, uh, you know, people kind of getting started on their journey or already started and in the midst of, um, keep going. Or if you haven't started yet, try it, just do it, try it and see. I think, um, you know, I had never been in nonprofit before on the business side. I had never started a business before and just saying yes and deciding to just start whatever that looks like. You don't need all the things you don't need, you know, all of the money or whatever you just, if you have an idea, get a notebook, start writing it down, save an Instagram handle or name or make yourself a business plan. I think, um, I really want to empower more people to just try. Um, There's a lot of, I think, good momentum behind the ideas that just nag at you. And a lot of the times, especially being adults, we kind of push those things beside us or we don't have enough time or there's just not enough X, Y, Z. And trying to bury some of those thoughts and just going with it or knowing that there's going to be, you know, trial and error always, but just trying it, Um, whether that's, you know, a community group or an idea you have at work. um, I just really want to empower people to, you know, go out, do the thing, try the idea. Don't worry about failure. YOLO. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I, I love that answer as usual, like, uh, but <laughs> you're killing it. Um, I'll, I'll go adjacent with that. I think what Monique said is, is so profound and so true is like, just try it or be willing to try it and just like start small, like big ideas can be overwhelming. So like what she was saying, start small, write it down, um, come up with a plan and just do little pieces. And adjacent of that, I would say, find someone who supports you, find someone who is going to encourage you and who's going to be that healthy person in your life who was like, you know, your idea, even if they don't agree with you, like, or they don't see or have your vision, we all need someone who is like, you know what? I appreciate that you're trying that. I'm here for you. What do you need me to do? You need me to share it? You need me to, what do you need me to do? Buy the Cokes or the drinks? What do you need me to do? Mm-hmm. Um, just having someone who's a cheerleader or who's gonna encourage you. Um, so find find those spaces. If you're surrounded by people who are not encouraging you or who aren't 
in the same space that you are and are ready to go out on a limb and do those things and maybe kind of, you know, appreciate you, love you, but, you know, going over here um, and find someone who is going to encourage you, whether that's a mentor, whether that's like a coworker, an old teacher, some, you know, someone um, who's going to be that voice to kind of, you know, encourage you to just try something. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I know we've been talking a lot of different about a lot of different things here, but um, are there is there anything that maybe we had did not cover that you would like to share and let people know? Well, I do run a nonprofit. So uh, as a nonprofit leader, I'm going to take every opportunity to mm -hmm. fundraise. So <laughs> a little bit of good is a 501c nonprofit organization, and we are a startup and actively fundraising. Um, like I said, we have our very first cohort starting next month. Um, we take these nonprofit leaders through four months of training and master classes and networking and mental health and well-being provided by YWCA. Um, <laughs> but full-fledged focus on uh, scaling Black organizations. Our mission's vision um, really is to eradicate the funding inequity seen in the nonprofit sector. So littlebitofgood.org. We also have our Change for a 20 uh, campaign on Give Butter. If you know someone who we should talk to, who I should speak with, um, if you know someone who's passionate about serving the Black community in Austin, we'd love volunteers, networking, all the things. So please mm -hmm. definitely reach out, find us on LinkedIn. However else, we're on all the socials, so. I will definitely be looking you up. Um, <laughs> I think we covered pretty much everything. I'll just say thank you, Laura and YWCA for this opportunity. Um, when you first invited me, I was like, ooh, I don't know if she knows who I am or why she would do this, but um, thank you. This was a great, fun experience. Um, and yeah, just look up Explore Austin. If you have um, a kiddo who you think would be would benefit for um, our program, they do have to qualify for free or reduced lunch. Um, but yeah, exploreaustin.org and always reach out if you have questions. Well, thank you both very much. I really, uh, earlier when I said, oh, if, if my internet goes out, you all just keep talking because I knew that you're much more important voice than, than what my, my questions that I had anyways. So, but yes, I appreciate you both, everything you both shared. I think you're both amazing and you need to write your books and your stories and get, get your stories out there because I, I'm very, very glad that you, you were able to join me and uh, we'll put your information on our link here after the video is done and yes if anybody would like to continue this conversation continue working on social justice issues uh, you can also reach out to YWCA and our main line and uh, or also contact Anitra and Monique for for their programs that would be wonderful um, so again, thank you all very much. And I appreciate your time. Thank you so much.